all coming down tonight. Um, I'm Raven, I'm the new president of OPS as of this term. Um, so some of you I think I met at the hustings, um, but if you weren't there, then hopefully I'll get to meet you soon. Um, I'm studying psychology at Teddy Hall currently. Um, and basically, OPS to me, in addition to being really relevant to my degree, because of all the content about how psychedelics affect the way that you really think, was mostly a great community and opportunity to meet people that were really creative and like-minded as well. So hopefully that's what it could be to you. Um, and in that spirit, um, hopefully I'll meet as many of you as I can. And if you have any ideas for any workshops, or lectures that you think would be good to put on, um, please just message me, because we're always looking for a new content that would be really engaging. Um, if you're not sure what I'm on about, um, and maybe you haven't come to one of these talks before, or you're here from the Psychology Society, what the Psychedelic Society does is it provides an academic platform to discuss all the scientific research around how psychedelic drugs actually work in the brain, um, as well as their therapeutic potential for disorders like depression and PTSD. Um, and we don't limit it just to that, it can also be the positive impact that they can have on individuals' lives when they're used responsibly. Um, we host a whole range of events, so we have educational lectures like this one, but we also have healing events which have a more spiritual turn or a lot of social events um, which hopefully will foster that really good sense of informal community which is often somewhat lacking in the traditional Oxford um, academic scene. <laughs> So this is a collaboration lecture with the Oxford University Psychology Society. It's our very first collaboration, um, and I just hope that it'll help to foster a collaborative spirit between the two societies, and hopefully form to form scientific links within the university. Um, so I'm really excited for any future interdisciplinary collaborations that we're going to have because I think it'll help psychedelics be taken a lot more seriously within the university community. So this is Ray, he's the speakers officer from the Oxford University Psychology Society and he's just going to tell you a bit more about the collaboration and about what the society itself does. Take it away. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ray, as Raven kind of introduced. Um, first, we'd like to uh, thank you so much for reaching out uh, to do this collaboration because um, Oxford University Psychology Society is, uh, has a huge focus on uh, interdisciplinary work, uh, especially because it's one of the most interdisciplinary subjects that you can mix with other things. And um, the collaboration with uh, psychedelics has been uh, long coming already because um, we Especially now that uh, psychedelics is suggested to be used in uh, psychotherapy, for example, LSD can be used to treat uh, alcoholism, or as suggested by researchers in the uh, 60s. And so uh, we are really looking forward to learning more about this, because um, this is not uh, our particular field of expertise at the moment, but um, with so much to learn from. Uh, we think that this collaboration will be very meaningful, and uh, once again, thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so without further ado, I'll allow Professor Nutt to introduce and commence his lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lady Lloyd. It's, uh, it's always nice to be here, actually. Um, you didn't mention that I was here once. I was here from 79 to uh, 86, and uh, when I was here, across the road was a cricket pitch. Now it's a building, I don't know what's in it, but anyway, things have changed, but possibly for the better anyway. So, but it's always nice to be back, and uh, thank you for inviting me here. So today I'm going to share with you the, uh, the mostly work that we've done over the last decade to try to produce a, a scientific foundation for future uh, studies, both uh, scientific and clinical, with psychedelics. Uh, 
Because I think uh, if we are going to resurrect them as therapies, and certainly if we're going to sort of change the public prejudice against psychedelics, it's got to be done on the basis of science. It's got to be on the back of, of evidence, uh, high quality research. So that's what we've been trying to do. And it's just over 10 years ago that I injected the first person ever to get an IV injection, a Silas IV, in a brain scanner in Britain. And uh, it seems like a long time ago, 10 years, but uh, it's gone very quickly because so much has happened. And, and I'm going to share that with you today. So for those of you who don't know about psychedelics, they're... They've been around for a long time. Uh, there are a whole range of different psychedelics shown here, and uh, you could argue that psychedelics are an enduring feature of almost all human cultures. Actually, modern Western culture is really the only culture that's tried to eliminate them from uh, existence or from being used. So if you go around from the top left, you've got some peyote uh, mushrooms, you've got some magic mushrooms, sorry, peyote cacti, you've got some magic mushrooms. On the top right, you've got uh, a couple of plants uh, being brewed up in the, uh, in the Amazon or near the Amazon to make ayahuasca. You've got bottom right, Amanita muscaris, morning glory. And the most important, really, is on the bottom left. On the bottom left is a vase. It's 3,000 years old, that image. And it shows a Greek noble person partaking of rye. And the rye, we believe, was contaminated, uh, infected, some would say, with this fungus called ergot. And ergot produces a weak form of uh, LSD. In fact, LSD is derived from uh, 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 the ergotamine that ergot makes. And the ancient Greeks knew that uh, that combination of ergot and wine made for really good holidays. And uh, those of you who've been away beta, you haven't really touched the core of it. They went away. When the, when the um, temperature fell and the... the the fields got a bit moist and the, and the ergot started to grow. They, the Romans would leave the city-states, they'd go into the meadows and they would engage in celebrations of this combination of alcohol and psychedelics. For a couple of weeks they called them the Lucinian Mysteries and they would then go back to their city-states and they would do what the ancient Greeks were really good at doing, like inventing things like uh, geometry and uh, algebra and uh, art and brilliant pottery. Uh, in fact, you could argue the whole foundation of Western, the concept of Western civilization was built on their opening up their minds with this combination of two separate agents, the most important one of which, of course, was the ergot, because they were drinking wine all the rest of the year. There's another more, less spoken about, but in some ways potentially even more powerful uh, history. It's the possibility that Christianity was fueled by taking a particular mushroom, uh, you can see the Amanita muscaris mushroom there. And um, some people will find this perhaps, you know, against their, uh, certainly it's against the teachings of the church, but, but until about the 11th century, I think it was probably accepted that actually the tree of life in, in the Garden of Eden wasn't actually an apple tree, because apples hadn't been invented then, they were <laughs> cultivated much more recently. And you can see that fresco in the middle here, the plain cooked fresco, shows in fact that the tree of life was actually a mushroom. And, uh, and there were several examples of, of mushrooms in uh, Christian uh, art up to about the 11th or 12th centuries. And it is argued in this book by John Allegro that in fact it was a major way of bonding Christians together, allowing them the, the inner strength and insight into their position in the universe to combat or the vicissitudes that they were subjected to under, for instance, the Romans. And uh, perhaps the most important one image here is the bottom right-hand one. This is a Canterbury Psalter. This is the sort of definitive art book of creation. And you can see there that when God created plants, he actually didn't create plants, he created mushrooms. <laughs> so it's an interesting story, one that is, as I say, controversial, but probably true. Anyway, let's move back, or move forward now a couple of thousand years to the end of the 19, 1800s when this man, William James, so this is a psychological society meeting in part and William James, as all new psychology students know, was one of the founders of modern psychology. Remarkable man in many, for many reasons, but uh, one of the things he did was to explore his unconscious. He used mescaline 
and uh, he used nitrous oxide uh, to essentially determine what the limits of his consciousness were. And from those insights, he said this, our normal waking consciousness is but one special type of consciousness. Whilst all about it, parted from it, on the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. And this is the quote that I think underpins everything I have done, at least in terms of psychopharmacology for the last 40 years. Uh, no account of the universe in its totality can be final that leaves these disregarded. So he's basically laying down the challenge. If you want to understand the universe, which I guess a lot of us do, if we're scientists, you've got to understand autoconsciousness. Of course, he couldn't do it. He didn't have the technology in his day. The best he could do was look at how people flushed and how their body temperature changed when they gave them drugs. And he said this, how to regard them is the question, for they're so discontinuous with ordinary consciousness. But the great thing is that modern neuroscience allows us to study them. So he was the sort of great uh, beginner in this field. Uh, but the person who really took up the challenge and popularized the, the issue of understanding consciousness with psychedelics was this man, Aldous Huxley. So he uh, was, uh, he wanted to be a doctor, but he couldn't because his, um, he had very severe problems with his uh, corneas. He, he couldn't see very well. So he came here to Oxford. He studied English literature and his language. I read a lot, wrote a lot, was pretty disenchanted with life until, like many people, his life changed when he took a psychedelic. He started off with mescaline and it produced a profound alteration in his way of thinking, which he wrote about in that book, The Doors of Perception. And I guess you don't let anyone into your society, do you, Raven, unless they've read that and can answer those questions. <laughs> <laughs> Why did he use the term Doors of Perception in his book? Well, in order to try to explain to the reading public what the experience of mescaline was like, he decided to use this quote from William Blake. Now, William Blake is uh, the great English mystic, uh, poet, painter, philosopher. And like many great artists, he could see things that... Us and... Blake wrote this once, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite. For man has closed himself up, said he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. So the doors of perception are from that Blake quote. And the great insight that Huxley had was that those doors were opened by mescaline. Can you, can you some of you at the back move along and let these people at the back, if, or some old friends of mine, have a seat, because I don't want him to collapse in front of you. <laughs> you could disrupt my talk. Because I have to prove I was a doctor, then here's some CPR. <laughs> now, Huxley made this statement after experience in psychedelics, and it's a phenomenally insightful statement. He said, the brain is an instrument for focusing the mind. And that it's kind of interesting for all sorts of level. You know, it's, a lot of people say that's dualism, but, but it's actually, of course, right. And um, what's fascinating is for me now to show you how neuroscience has actually proved Huxley right. So, how many of you are not neuroscientists? Great, okay, so this is, I'm gonna, so I'll take you slowly through this, okay. This is how the brain works. So let's start with vision. You're seeing something. You're seeing that image up there, right? That image, what you see is not what's there. It's, your brain is not a camera. Your brain decodes that image. And it decodes it in your retina into a whole series of different electrical signals which move up from your eye into your brain. And they go to different parts of the brain. Part, the colour bits go to one part. The movement goes to another part. Uh, location goes to another part. And your brain, and that's a lot of your brain, about 20% of your brain is just reconstructing what you're seeing there now. So your brain makes an approximation, an estimate of what's out there. And because it's doing this every couple of hundred milliseconds, 
that uses an awful lot of brain power. So your brain, by and large, is pretty lazy. And it's worked out who I am. And it doesn't even bother now. For the rest of this talk, your brain won't even bother to look at me again, because he knows I'm going to be there. But if I was to morph into a, into a tiger or a gorilla, it would probably take a few minutes before you realised I wasn't me, because your brain isn't interested. He knows it. That's very unlikely. So your brain is very efficient. It, does, it makes judgments as to what's going on in a most efficient way. And this is what Blake was saying. Blake was saying, most of us just see a very limited aspect of the world. Our brain allows us to see through narrow chinks of our cavern. But for most of us, when we look out of this cavern, we see something quite pleasant. You know, we see blue skies and uh, white clouds and flowers and trees, etc. But if you suffer from depression, when you look out on the world, you see a much grey, a greyer world, an unpleasant world, a world that is lacking in colour and vitality. And of course, if you're an addict, when you look into the world, you see pretty much nothing but memories or you know, reflections of your love object, your bottle or your heroin syringe, etc. So your, what you see is determined by your brain, not by what's out there. And this is, this is a, a hugely important insight because your brain is controlling your mind. Now, of course, soon after, Huxley uh, wrote uh, The Doors of Perception. He started taking his drug LSD. LSD is the first synthetic psychedelic. It's a, it's a stable, long-acting analogue of um, ergot. Invented by that man there, Albert Hoffman. There he is, sitting in his... Uh, Villa overlooking Lake Geneva at 100 years of age, having taken it at least monthly for the last 50 years, and um, it certainly didn't, didn't do any harm to his brain. Interestingly, the, the first British person to take it lived to 103, even exceeding the 102 of Hoffman. So th th these drugs don't cause premature death. Whether they, whether they cause longevity is another question, but we're going to be difficult to study that. <laughs> that wasn't quite what his house looked like. I think that's a little bit of LSD. Uh, in the artist. So Hoffman discovered LSD, but perhaps the uh, a more important and interesting historical note is are the people who used it. So, so these are two Nobel Prize winners. Unfortunately, from the, they're from the wrong city, at least uh, Francis Crick was, he's from Cambridge, but anyway, never mind. I was there too, so that's all right. Um, Crick discovered how you basically how life is formed. He discovered how to decode DNA. And Kerry Mullis was trying to work out how to get enough DNA so he could work out if different forms of DNA did different things. And he was struggling. And one day, during a LSD-induced trip, he saw the solution to his problem. And the solution was to unravel the um, double helix. Uh, and he saw it, he saw the DNA molecule unraveling in front of his eyes like a series of serpents. And the serpentine hallucinations are very common with psychedelics. And he realized that's what he had to do. He had to find an enzyme that basically replicated all, all strands of DNA. And he hunted around, he found an enzyme called the polymerase enzyme in some bacteria. He made a lot of it, he made lots of DNA, and he got the Nobel Prize. And he said categorically, I would never have gone the Nobel Prize if I hadn't got that insight into how to, to study this um, very complicated molecule of DNA. Crick, having sorted out uh, how DNA, he then helped Sanger get the Nobel Prize for sorting out RNA and then protein synthesis. And then he took LSD. And this, both of these were using it before it was banned, it was in the 50s. And Crick came to a realization that actually solving the problem of life was easy, DNA is easy. Solving the problem with the mind is much more difficult. And unfortunately, he got engaged in using psychedelics uh, just before they were made illegal. And uh, it is, he did it one day. The police in Cambridge went to his house where he would have great parties every weekend. Uh, they found his house quite easily because he stuck a golden helix outside. To sort of <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they said, you've got to stop doing this. Your parties are now illegal. And he did a very interesting little thing, actually, I suppose, a quite sensible thing. He said, well, stuff you. And he left. He left Britain, went to America, never came back. Uh, we lost, so we lost perhaps our greatest scientist since Newton, 
just because we changed the drug laws, what he was thinking about the nature of consciousness. Now, certainly, I think Mullis would say that, uh, would agree with Einstein with this quote, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness as created. And to a large extent, Crick, what well, he did, he spent the last 30, 40 years of his life trying to solve the problem of consciousness. And he wrote this book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, The Scientific Search for the Soul. To us now, it's actually not astonishing at all. He basically says the mind comes out of the brain and there isn't a soul. The soul is a construct of the brain. But at that time, it was kind of radical. And, uh, and Crick said this, there is no scientific study more vital to man than the study of his own brain. Our entire view of the universe depends on it. And I guess we all agree with him, don't we? You know, whether we're in a psychedelic society or the psychological society, we're all very interested in the, the relationship between our brain and our mind. And the Crick spent a lot of time working with Thomas Koch, and they came to the conclusion based on anatomy and some physiology that the claustrum, the claustrum is a very strange, uh, little researched uh, strip of brain which underpins much of the cortex. And they came to the view that the claustrum was a sort of seat of consciousness and it orchestrated the activity of, of, the, of the cortex above it. And to some extent they were right, they're actually not completely right, but the claustrum is a very interesting target area for thinking about consciousness. Because they, what we have since discovered is that the claustrum is probably the site of action of this drug, Salvina, Salvia divinorum, which features all interesting alterations of consciousness, quite different from those of a psychedelic, but nonetheless powerful and interesting in a scientific sense. So there are uh, certainly, all, you know, the claustrum may be involved in some forms of altered consciousness, but not the classic psychedelic ones. And one of the interesting aspects about the psychedelic, psychedelic history was that when Hoffman discovered LSD, he thought it was very important. He took it, as I told you himself, regularly. He persuaded the company he worked for, Sando, that this was going to revolutionize medicine. And they believed him, and he was right, of course. And he would have done if he'd been allowed to continue to pursue it. And they made it available. They about a thousand uh, sort of registered scientists around the world and doctors and psychiatrists were allowed to get hold of this. There it is, there's a, an example, it was a medicine, it was called Delacif, and you could register and they would send it to you and you could study it. And it was studied for four reasons. It was studied to model psychosis. And we're still doing that today. We have uh, recently completed a study using psilocybin, magic mushroom juice, to produce psychotic-like experiences in people, normal people, healthy people, to see if a possible new, radical new kind of uh, treatment for psychosis might attenuate them. This is a, a drug called the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It's actually an anti-cancer drug. It's not used to, to, be, to treat cancer anymore because it gets in the brain and it does things in the brain. One of the things it does in the brain is dampen down the psychedelic experience to psilocybin. And now we are testing it to see if it can dampen down psychotic experiences in people with psychosis. The second reason uh, LSD was used was for self-experimentation by mental health professionals. Many junior doctors, when they became their, their first day age, signed up to be a psychiatrist. They went along and their consultant said to them, tomorrow you're going to be given LSD. <laughs> and they came back and they took their LSD and, and they had they had a trip. And collecting data from Many of them still remember in great detail the experience of that first trip. And they were given it, given it in order that they could understand what it is like to think differently like their patients do. And then there were the therapies with um, psychedelics. There was psychedelic psychotherapy, which is like what we do today, where we give a big dose, people have a powerful trip, and they come out of it with a different view of their, of their world and their life and their meaning and, and their illness. And then there was also the psycholytic psychotherapy, which is a bit more like microdosing, sort of you know, mini dosing. So people got experiences, but they didn't have a full trip. But they, their brain changed enough so that they could actually better engage with the psychotherapy or the psychoanalysis they were doing at the time. And uh, many, many, many studies were done 
thousands of people have studied. And this man, Stan Groff, who pioneered the use of psychedelics after they were made illegal, said this, and it's a, it's a very, very important statement. Psychedelics, used responsibly and with proper caution, would be for psychiatry, what the microscope is for biology and medicine, or the telescope for astronomy. And that begs the fundamental question, is why don't we use them today? And to understand that, we have to understand the perverse nature of drugs and drug policy. And, uh, and this particular episode centered around the Vietnam War. Because the war was going badly, young people, 18 year old men were being, all of them coming to Oxford to study, they were, were Harvard, they were being sent off to fight in a country they never heard of, fighting a war that they didn't understand, against an enemy they'd never see. And some of them were saying, no, I don't want to do that. And uh, they were reading the writings of people like Ron Kovic, who said, some of you have seen the footies in the film, you know, he's uh, got his, has his back blown in half, so he's uh, an invalid. All I could feel was the worthlessness of right here in this place and in this moment, all for nothing. And Michael O'Brien said, I didn't want to die, not ever. But certainly not then, not there, not in the wrong war. And LSD was seen as part fueling the anti-war movement. And quite a lot of these young men who were going to be sent to fight decided to run away to Canada or to go to San Francisco where they took LSD, they put flowers in their hair, they listened to the Grateful Dead, they read the work of uh, Leary. But worst of all, they protested the war. And there's that image, that black and white photograph there of an anti-war protest. Drop acid, not bombs. And that was such an amazing threat to the US government that they decided they had to get rid of acid so that people wouldn't have a choice. It would always be bombs. And I kind of think that's one of the most remarkable statements, one of the most requests probably ever made. Huh? <coughs> I, I kind of wonder whether, if we actually dropped acid in Syria, we wouldn't have six million refugees destabilizing the whole of Europe. But hey, you know, well, that's just a theory, isn't it? But in those days, you couldn't get rid of you couldn't get rid of a drug just because people were enjoying it. No, you had to find some evidence of harm. So the CIA and the Drug Enforcement Agencies decided to create the fiction of harm, and they persuaded sort of people that edit these kind of rags to create a whole series of scare stories about lies. And in those days, and it's still today, even if you write a lie about a drug, if it gets published, a newspaper publication is seen as, a, as concerning. Why would an editor publish something he wasn't concerned? And this was justification for getting the drug banned. And once it was banned in the US, it inevitably was banned here because all our drug policies have always been at the behest of the US. But what's more chilling, and this really is chilling, is that these drugs were banned, even though the most powerful man in the world, and certainly the most powerful man in America, Bobby Kennedy, did not want them banned. And yet he's talking, he's talking to his regulators. And he's saying, well look, why if these LSD projects were so important six months ago, why? NIH, the American National Institute of Health, they funded 130 separate studies on LSD. You're telling me they were useful then, but now they're worthless? We keep on going around and around. If I could get a flat answer about that, I'd be happy. Is there a misunderstanding about my question? He knew he was being lied to. He knew his bureaucrats were lying to him. And he said, I think perhaps we've lost sight of the fact that LSD can be very, very helpful in our society to use properly. But even he could not stop these drugs being banned. Because this remorseless bureaucratic process of banning drugs is, uh, works beyond the level of even for the sensible political uh, uh, opposition. And they were banned. And they've been banned since 1967. And, well, effectively until Denver last week, they've been banned everywhere since, not just in a couple of countries, but in the whole 197 countries that have signed up to the uh, UN conventions on this. And I believe that's the worst example of censorship of research in the history of the world. 
certainly a censorship of science and censorship of medical research. Well, you might say, well, really? What about George Bush's ban on stem cell research, fetal stem cell research? They say, well, that was only in America. That was good because all the clever scientists came to work in Britain. Yeah? <laughs> but the, the ban on psychedelics extended to the whole world. And in fact, you've got to go back a long way to find anything that might be remotely equivalent. In fact, you've got to go back to 1616 when the, the Catholic Church banned the writings of Copernicus. And they did that because they didn't want the world to know the truth. It's exactly the same reason as why LSD was banned. The establishment did not want the people to know that LSD was useful. They didn't want the world to know that the Earth was not the centre of the universe. That ban lasted 150 years, but actually there weren't that many <coughs> astronomers, and it only applied to Catholic ones, so the North European Protestants could carry on looking at the skies and doing their research. So the actual area under the research curve lost. It's pretty trivial. The ban on psychedelics has lasted 50 years. It's ongoing, pretty much, except in small pockets of resistance like my group. And the, the amount of new research opportunity that's been lost in those 50 years is massive. Now, when you talk to regulators and legislators, they say, no, the UN conventions do not ban the research on drugs. They just make sure you comply with a very uh, reasonable level of safety. Okay, well, that may be true, but in practice, they ban research. So this, this graph shows... The number of papers published every year on LSD in blue, psilocybin in red, up to the banning in 1967. And then you can see, after a couple of years where there was obviously data being analysed and written up, the uh, number of papers virtually disappears. Now, the US, up before that point, as I told you, had funded 130 studies. After that point, it has never funded a study. So yes, of course you can, if you get through the regulations, you can do this research. But you can't get money to do the research. And the hurdles, getting, getting through this regulatory morass, is like being in a Kafka play. You, no one knows what the rules are. Not even the bureaucrats know what the rules are. So in the end, you just can't get through it. It's truly, truly challenging. If you're interested in this, there's a couple of papers I've written that explore it, probably the origins, the history, and the, and the, and the, and the mistakes and the lies that have been told. Um, so feel free to read those. So we've been fighting back, and Raven mentioned that uh, this work was kicked off uh, as it, over 10 years ago now in collaboration with the Beckley Foundation, which is a, a charity seated just north of Oxford in Beckley that uh, is also trying to basically restore a rational uh, attitude to psychedelic and other research. So let me go into a little bit of pharmacology. I'm a psychopharmacologist. I'm a psychiatrist by training a psychopharmacologist. I'm, I'm interested in how drugs affect the mind. So here you see a graph which shows the affinity of a whole range of different drugs for the serotonin 2A receptor. And here is the potency in humans. So up here you have LSD, which is very high affinity, very potent. Down here you have mescaline, which is low affinity and not very potent. And here you have psilocybin, which is Pretty, pretty potent, so micrograms, milligrams, but uh, is on the same axis. All the psychedelics are on this axis. Their potency is determined by their affinity receptor, and that tells us they all work through this receptor. <coughs> we decided to start off working with uh, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms called psilocybin. At the time, it was so hard to get hold of. We couldn't afford very much. We had to use it intravenously because that reduces the dose by tenfold. Um, now we can, it's cheaper, so we can get it, use it orally. Why did we use psilocybin? Well, it's, uh, it's safe. We knew about a million people were using magic mushrooms every year illegally, uh, no deaths. Uh, we know it gives a, a kind of uh, a, a, a trip which is generally not extreme, not uh, very disturbing. It's quite controlled time-wise. Uh, intravenously, the trip lasts about 35, 40 minutes. Orally, it lasts about four to five hours. 
And another very important thing is that no journalist or politician knows how to say or spell psilocybin. <laughs> so they get really worried about taking you on in public. <laughs> now these, the receptors that, that these drugs work on are called the 5-HT2A receptor. This is a fascinating receptor. It's not generally known that I did the first study of the role of these receptors in human brain when I was here in Oxford, back in 1984. In those days, we could only use an antagonist. We got hold of the most newest, most powerful antagonist of these receptors. And we gave them to people in our sleep center. And they had a good night's sleep. And all we saw was they had more deep sleep, which is an increased density of slow wave sleep. And then I had to wait you know, nearly 30 years to we could actually understand what they really did by giving a drug which didn't just block them, but actually stimulated them, which is what Cytostatic does. Now this, this, is, this is your head, you can move here. It's for the psychologist, this is the head, I think. <laughs> <laughs> this is the cortex here. This is a heat map. The highest density of these receptors are in this area of the brain, anterior cingulate prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate cortex. There are more of these receptors in the human brain than in, in the brain of any other species. And then more of them in the most highly evolved parts of your brain than other parts of the brain. There's not many of them down here deep in the thalamus and the brainstem. These receptors have evolved along with hum human consciousness, the human brain. Some people believe that they have driven the vast expansion of size and ability that the human brain shows over all other brains. Hard to test, but it's possible. Anyway, these receptors are in the part of the brain where the really high level interesting aspects of brain function take place. So what happens when you stimulate them? Well, when we go into more depth into the brain, we see that they have a particularly interesting distribution in this layer of brain cells here. And this is called the layer five level of cells in the cortex. And these are the cells which integrate brain function. The brain is a two-dimensional computer. There's neurons which go up most of the first level processing is done vertically in these things called cortical columns. And then the second level processing across the brain is done through these layer five thalamic cells. And that's where these receptors are. So these receptors, we believe, regulate cross uh, cortical functioning, particularly the integration between what's coming in and what is being predicted. Because as I explained earlier on, your brain is a predictive machine. It, it's generally worked out. As I said, you know, that I'm me, and you don't really have to worry about me being not being here for the next hour. So we gave psilocybin, uh, we did a brain scanning uh, using MRI, and we found to our amazement that when these people were seeing all these wonderful coloured lights and they were floating out into space and one got to the foot of God and bowed down in front of him, he came back, which is always good news when we gave the scanner. <laughs> We thought there'd be increased activity in the brain, but there wasn't. There was just decreased activity. In these regions where there's a high density of those receptors, and also the thalamus, which is a secondary relay station between them. And we thought, that's so bizarre. How can these drugs be switching off the brain? They're supposed to turn on the brain. That's what we were told by Leary. So we did a game using another MRI technique called BOLD. Got the same results. These drugs turn off the brain. How can you get a psychedelic experience by turning off the brain? Well, we're pretty sure that's what's going on because the areas of the brain which were turned off, the more they were turned off, the more, the greater the impact you have on consciousness. And we started to think about what we knew about these, what these brain regions do. And here's a, quite an interesting construct, which is 10 years or so, 15 years old now. And it, it's the, the idea that there are hubs in the brain which regulate brain function. These were called connector hubs in those days. And these are the two connector hubs that people knew about. The anterior connector hub, which integrates your thinking, your feeling with your memories and emotions, and the posterior connector hub, which integrates your seeing, your hearing, with your proprioception, your balance, your taste, your smell, etc. And these are the regions which were switched off. And what we believe now is that psych psychedelics like psilocybin switch off these control centers. And so the brain goes away and does its own things. These are like the conductors of an orchestra. If you take the conductor away, the brain, the orchestra doesn't play what the conductor wants. It can do 
instead of playing Mozart, it can go away and do what it really wants to do, which is play jazz. And that breaking down of the barriers, we think, is well, the, the ongoing construct is what the psychedelic state is. And what was so wonderful about that insight was it exactly was exactly what Huxley predicted. Psychedelics lower the efficiency of the brain as an instrument for focusing the mind. So yeah, well, sorry Huxley, I'm sorry you weren't alive to see it, but well, we did spend, it was 50 years too late for you, but we got there in the end. <laughs> Thanks for giving us the uh, insight. So just to make sure you all understand what I'm talking about, let's go back, you're seeing things, the electrical signals are going into the brain, the brain is reconstructing what you think you're seeing, but it can't because we have stopped the cross-brain integration. The neurons which are pulling it all together aren't working because we disturb them with the psychedelic. <coughs> so in fact, what you see is, oops, what you see is something like this. And what is really interesting, to my mind, this is the, this is the most wonderful insight. You can see, for the first time, how your brain works at the low level. The, this is primary, the primary visual processing of your brain. You're no, normally, you're not allowed to see because it's always built up into something which is like what you expect to see, which is me or her or something else. But when you can't do that, then you can actually get a glimpse of the primary processing of the brain. I had a brilliant conversation a few months ago with, the, with someone who was telling me about their side of side of the you know, there's one really weird thing happening. For 20 seconds, the world was upside down. And I said, well, that's exactly right. The world is upside down. I mean, your eyes, when you see me, everything's inverted, right? Your eyes invert everything. The world is upside down, and your brain puts it the right way up. And that was the first time I'd actually ever met that experience, I don't know if anyone else, where actually the ability of your brain to put the world up the right way was disrupted. 20 seconds, his brain was seeing what his eyes saw, which is an upside down world. That network, those control centers, we now know how we've re kind of renamed them and we've moved them now from a, just being two nodes to being a network. And the network is called the default mode network. And that's a very interesting network because the network we didn't know existed until we did brain imaging. It's the great contribution that brain imaging has made to, to neuroscience. <coughs> There's a network in your brain that does things that you need to do when you are thinking about yourself, your past, your present, and your future. It's called the default mode network. As soon as you're doing something like listening or seeing, it's switched off. But when you're reflecting on life, your default mode network is active. So when you go home tonight and you, you, know, you sit down and you lie in bed and you think, was it worth going to hear that guy now? That's your default mode, and it's making a decision whether, it's, whether it was worth it or not. Under psychedelics, that default mode is completely disrupted. And some people would say the default mode here, this is where your sense of self is. If you disrupt it, you don't have a sense of self. And that's why many people find that they feel that their body is floating away into space because the, the, the ability of those parts of the brain to hold their sense of self together is temporarily uh, disrupted. Now, actually, getting something published on these drugs was very difficult. So we had these kind of referees' comments. Well, it's all just blood flow changes from 5 HC receptors on blood vessels. Obviously, it couldn't be because it was too localized. What do you expect if you mess with the brain and psychedelics? <laughs> well, I'd expect better refereeing, actually. <laughs> Especially the first time anyone has ever done it. I thought, I thought the scientific world might be quite interested in this, you know, because it is, they've waited a long time for it. But I think one of the problems is that people have tried to push these drugs out of the public view for so long that even scientists are scared of thinking about them. And this is a great quote from Huxley. How many of you are scientists? How many of you are doing research? Great, a lot of you good. Well, put this above your desk. <laughs> Orthodoxy is the diehard of the world of thought. It learns not, neither can it forget. Now, he wasn't writing about science. He was writing about thought. But he's, it's exactly right. So much science is orthodox, but orthodoxy doesn't change the scientific paradigm. We've got to break free from it. 
Anyway, just to appease these referees, we decided to go and do another experiment using a method, uh, imaging method, which didn't rely on blood flow, but relied on electrical changes in the brain. It's called mag magnetoencephalography. And there, we got the same thing. We got this powerful disruption of synchronized brain activity, particularly in these posterior brain regions across the frequency range. And here you see the default mode. This is the, this is the network of self disrupted measuring using MEG, electrical activity, rather than um, blood, brain, uh, blood flow with, uh, with, with uh, fMRI. And again, you could see a good correlation. The more we disrupt, this, particularly this posterior hub, the greater the sense of ego dissolution. Uh, uh, so this is reduction in power of the alpha waves there. So we're pretty sure now we have three separate experiments all showing the same thing. The other nice thing about MEG, for those of you interested in sort of the more um, mathematical neuroscience, the time, um, the time scale of uh, base of MEG is very, very fast, much faster than fMRI. So we could test the theory that had been derived from electrical recordings of cortical neurons. There's a little micro network which determines uh, the frequencies of brain oscillatory activity. And uh, following psilocybin, we you see the powerful reduction here in the alpha frequency. And it turned out that the best predictor using this model of um, mathematical modeling was that these, the drugs work on this layer five pyramidal. So I think that's actually the first time in history that anyone has been able to say that a drug works on a particular cell type in the brain actually demonstrated. And one of the other interesting things that came out of uh, our work was that we had a novel data set and biomathematicians are waiting, they're like vultures, they're waiting for someone to have a new data set and get in there and re dig around. And we've worked with three different sets of biomathematicians, and this is the one that came up with the most pretty picture. This is uh, <laughs> Paul Expert from King's College in London. So each of those images has 7,200 7, connections. But they look quite different, don't they? Because on the left-hand side, the normal side under placebo, most of the connections are around the edge. And this is what we call the small world construct. It's your brain being really efficient. Your brain doesn't want its visual cortex to talk to its frontal lobe unless it's really necessary. So most of the brain talks around the edge. And occasionally, obviously, you know, your vision's got to talk to your motor cortex to move this chiral coming in front of your face. But anyway, but mostly it's around the edge. But then the side of Simon, there's a lot more cross conversations. So the connectivity of the brain is increased. There's less around the edge, there's less rigidity. There's more fluidity, there's more crosstalk. And it's that crosstalk, I think, which gives people new insights into life. So having done that, well, we had to do we had to do the big challenge, which was LSD. There's old Hoffman with his model. There's that model I've shown you before. This is the bit he added on here. The dihethyl of my two ethyl in my groups. And LSD, of course, has morphed from being just a simple chemical to being a, an art form and it's a tattoo, and it's a t-shirt, and it's a jewellery, and um, with the exception of the cannabis leaf, I don't suppose any drug has ever taken on such a, a role in art. So we did the first ever imaging study with LSD, and we, because LSD, LSD trip lasts for about eight hours, we were able to do two sorts of brain imaging and then the MEG, and, uh, and I'll just briefly show you some of the results. You get the same thing with LSD, with a more powerful effect. You get perturbation of, of brain connectivity in a whole range of brain regions, including this network, the self-network. The more the self-network is dampened down, the greater the sense of ego dissolution, the greater the sense of your being not what you were before. In fact, we were able to test a prediction that this <coughs> part of this process was disconnecting the, the, the part of the brain which, the posterior cingulate, which works out where you are from the memory circuit, which kind of tells you where you were. And you can see that that disruption is strongly associated with alterations in the sense of uh, ego. And we're also able to look at this wonderful experience of complex hallucinations. Under LSD, people often see enormously vivid, powerful uh, images. And uh, when their eyes close, and that's because the brain is opened up. It's here we have what's happening in your brains now. You're looking at those images, I hope. And uh, this is your vis the visual, what's called V1, where the, the images from your eyes go in. And then most of what you're doing with your visual system is just 
basically updating minor changes of what each slide says. But under LSD, your visual cortex is connected right throughout the brain. So this is small world, this is really wide open. And, and that's why you can make connections, you can see things that you've never seen before. Uh, but also you can you get this phenomenon of synesthesia where you can, you know, you can, um, you can hear numbers or see smells, etc. because you've got connectivity you've never had before. Well, probably not since you were a child. One of the constructs that underpins a lot of this is that the whole process of, of turning a, a baby into an adult is constraining their brain so they do exactly the same thing as their parents and all other children. And that's great, you know, for learning a language or becoming an accountant, but it may not be the best way of, of actually coming to terms with emotions or art. And the MEG results similarly powerful destruction, dampening down of MEG activity. Oh, no, it's not going to be right. And um, I just want to show you an interesting comparison of different drugs under MEG. Because some of you probably tonight will go and do this drug here. It's called alcohol. <laughs> and there are three different kinds of drugs on here. Uh, I like MEG because it gives you a kind of fingerprint of each drug has a different brain print. So these are sedative drugs, and these are sedative drugs, except for ketamine, and these are psychedelic drugs. Psychedelic drugs, LSD, psilocybin, ketamine, all reduce synchronicity in the brain, especially in these low frequencies. Exactly the opposite of what we found when we gave a blocker of these receptors. So it took us a long time, but we got there. These drugs, they put you to sleep, they produce deep synchronicity. Some of these are I mean, in this, this particular experiment here, some of these people got so locked in, they, they couldn't move their arms, they just got frozen in a state of vulnerability. So you can see very powerful differences. And there's nothing quite like alcohol. It increases power across all these, probably to say that you actually uh, uh, don't remember what you do, but that's another story. Now, one of the th things that have come out of this in terms, at least in my own thinking about uh, the brain and consciousness, is I think now that we've got to see consciousness as being a kind of two-dimensional construct. Here is the normal waking consciousness, and here is, uh, which is driven by glutamate. The reason you're all awake now is because your glutamate system is beating your GABA system. When you go to sleep, your GABA system will win. And glutamate puts you in a state of arousal and attention. It lays down memories, and it does what I call parcellation. Your brain is an amazing. The amount of information that you've all taken in in the last hour is actually staggering. You know, most of you will have remembered something from every slide, and if I showed you the slide again, you, your brain is phenomenally good at laying down really fantastically detailed amounts of information, which I call parcellation. And that's all very well, but it might make no sense to you at all. And to make sense of it, in terms, at least in terms of emotional sense, you need some 5-HT2A stimulation. So the psychedelic state is about valence, good or bad, about meaning, what's it about, an integration, making sense of things that you perhaps never made sense of before. And they intersect. People remember vividly their trips because this system is still working. But the content is different. This is about integration. It's not about parcelation. It's about bringing things together rather than decepting them down into the tiniest separate elements. I just wanted to show you, some of you may not know about this, but we've we thought the most it was important to do a third serotonergic psychedelic in order just to be absolutely certain that this disruption of, of synchronicity in the brain was what was going on. So we've done a DMT study. DMT is difficult to use. We couldn't use ayahuasca for various technical reasons. So we had to get pure DMT and we had to inject it. We inject it into people. This is the power of the EG. This is your normal alpha power. You see, as soon as the DMT gets in the brain, it disrupts. <coughs> There's the time course of the DMT in the brain, and here's the time. And if it comes out of the brain, the part, half the power comes out. So this is a you know, profound perturbation of um, brain function, just the same as with psilocybin or LSD. But here, we, we also were cognizant of the fact that many people who take DMT, especially if you inject it as we did, or if you smoke it and get it in very fast, you get a very, often get a, profound transition from one sort of state uh, to another. You, people often describe going into another universe, into a, another dimension. Often a better one, often more real, more bright, 
often with people, often with entities that you know, are good to them or supportive of them. So we, we're trying to find out where those entities are, and uh, or do they exist? And uh, so we got people to draw pictures of when they came out. So these are the different doses of DMT we use. It's a low dose, it's a high dose. And you can see that in the low dose, it's more these elemental hallucinations that you see in the psilocybin. And then you get these more complex serpentine hallucinations with a high dose. And on the very high dose, they saw things, people, peopleoids. Uh, so where they are, I don't know. I, I'm assuming they're in the brain. If they're not, then we really are rewriting science. But anyway, we're trying to find out uh, by doing brain imaging at the same time. Oh, we don't have the results yet, but we will in a year. I just want to also show one other thing about you. This, working with it in this field, it's been so illuminating. I'm sorry, pardon the pun. But uh, because we discover things that people knew, but were scared to talk about. So we've had people who've been colorblind, and they've gone into our studies, and they say, hey, oh, it's funny that the well, psychedelics have improved my color vision. You talk to them. Any, any visual physiologists here? Anyway, that's good fun. But uh, they say it's impossible because vision is, color is in the retina. But it's not just in the retina, it can be. So here's an image, here's an image. Uh, this is a very beautiful image of a church. This is a Moniz San Giorgio Maggiore at dusk in Venice. And this man wrote to me after this experience. And he suffers from a rare form of uh, color vision. And he was taken to see this picture by his brother, who's an art uh, enthusiast. And he said, this painting, which I had previously seen as a dull mass of brown and blue, all of the colors I was previously unable to see were there on the screen. And this, this guy was, was seeing this image under the effects of psilocybin. And the emotion that I felt made me unable to speak for about half an hour. So we have to, we've changed his vision of the world, but literally his vision. And I've been trying to work out what this is about, and the best I've come up with is the fact that we're getting back to the small world. Actually, for most of us, our brains don't really care about colour. We're not artists, though. So, you know, are there any artists here? Artists care about colour, but most of us, colour is just a way of distinguishing something, but it's not central to our life. So, in fact, it seems our brain has actually decided to park colour in one side of its brain, you know, to free up the other half of the brain to do more interesting things, like work out you know, what your face shape looks like or whether, you know, you've got, what kind of hair you've got. So I just think we may be suppressing colour and we may be breaking, liberating that suppression by using psychedelics. So that's something we're in the process of analysing. We've just got all the data from the Global Drug Survey and I'm collating all these case series of people whose colour vision has improved under psychedelics. And then finally, and that's, I'll, I'll be quick about this because I think Guy Goodwin spoke about it in your previous meeting. One thing that became very clear was that these drugs didn't have negative effects on people's mood. Even when you give them in a scanner, people often would come out and say, wow, that feels good, I feel better. And they'd often say they felt better for days or weeks afterwards. And about the same time as we started doing the imaging, this group in John Hopkins started doing psychotherapy. They started doing psychotherapies, the same dose as we gave, the 25 milligram dose of psilocybin, but here they're giving them to, to middle-aged people old men like me, who wanted to find some more meaning in life. So they're having a single psychedelic psilocybin trip. And many of these are saying it was one of the most powerful experiences of their lives. And some of these uh, benefits have lasted now for eight years. And because of that, and because of our people often feeling better, we decided it would be interesting to see if we get some money. We've never gotten any money from the government to do any work with psychedelics. Because if you approach them, they just laugh. And they say, well, we can't possibly give you funding to study illegal drugs. And you say, well, it's interesting science. They say, yeah, but the reputational risk. I think what the Daily Mail would do if we, and they would. I mean, the Daily Mail actually tried to stop us showing our first program on the psychedelics, but that's another story. But actually there was an MRC call back in 2012, uh, and we, I put in a grant to study psilocybin to treat resistant depression. And we got it, and that's interesting. And I think it's because depression is such a huge problem. Getting the grant was easy. It took three iterations to get the ethics to approve. And he said, well, you can't give psilocybin to depressed people. They might die. And I said, well, they didn't used to die in the 50s, you know, when it was a medicine. And a million people every year take it. They're not dying. Ah, but they're not depressed. 
Well, probably some of them are, actually. Before, anyway. anyway. But anyway, we, in the end, they wouldn't let us do a controlled trial. They said, we did a safety study, give psilocybin to 12 people for six months, and if none died, we could go and do a controlled trial. <laughs> right. At that point, you have to say yes. That was the third, I was sitting there. And you have, you've got to say yes, because otherwise there'd be no study. Um, the drug supply then took a lot longer. It took, there's only one place in the world it could make it to a safety level of quality that we could use, because it's an illegal drug. The import license, export license, it took three months. And another two months to get the regulators to approve. So it took 32 or 36 months grand to do the study, to start the study. Why? They'd say, why is it so difficult? Because of all the licenses. Uh, I'm a doctor, I can prescribe heroin. But when I say to the Home Office, why don't, I, why don't you let me put my psilocybin alongside my heroin? Whoa, can't do that. Whoa. <laughs> You've got to have a special safe in a special room with a camera to make sure you're not taking it out and snorting it. And I say, look, come on, I mean, if I want to take drugs, I... <laughs> <laughs> and in the end, it worked out about 1,500 pounds a dose just to protect you from the possibility I might be selling. This out. I mean, it's absurd, but that's what bureaucracy does. The fact, as I said at the beginning, the bureaucrats got it banned in the first place. They're, they have almost <laughs> infinite power. But it was great we did it because the effect was remarkable. So. So these are the 12 subjects which were put in the first part of the study to show that they didn't die. None of them died. Um, they were all depressed. They all failed on at least two drugs. Some had failed on 10 drugs or more. They all failed on CBT. And they all got better. And some of them got cured. If you're in the yellow band here, you're cured. And some of them stayed cured for months and others stepped back. And this is the group that are most, it's actually it's quite distressing. Some of these had powerful, normal, they were recovered. They were not depressed. They've been depressed for years. They're no longer depressed. And then they are depressed again. And they plead with me, can I have another dose? I can't give another dose. If I give another dose, they'll lock me up because I'm breaking the law. And that's, that is cruel. That is, it, that's the cruelty of these laws which actually stop people from allowing these medication. And I'm, I guess I'm going to stop now because I don't want to go into too much more. So I'll just say one, couple, one last thing. These drugs change the way people think. We think that in depression now, people get locked in. That default mode network, as I sh get locked into a way of seeing the world, which is depressive. Uh, as I showed you with the, the very early image of the depressed person looking out through the chinks of their cabin. And what psychedelics do is break that routine, repetitive, subconscious thought, think pro thought process so that people can think differently. So, so before treatment, depressed people have what's called a pessimism bias. They see the world as a nasty, hostile, miserable place. In fact, they're right, but that doesn't help. Seeing the world as horrible as it is means you just kind of give up. Whereas after treatment, they're like the rest of us. They have what's called an optimism bias, and we're, we're more hopeful as a future. And they do change people's outlook, and this is a what many of our patients said, but this is one example. My outlook has changed significantly. I'm more aware now. It's pointless to get wrapped up in endless negativity, this routine of negative thinking. I feel as if I've seen a much clearer picture. And many of our patients describe constructs like defragging the hard drive or reformatting the hard drive, clearing out this re repetitive thinking, allowing your mind to go back to where it was before it was cluttered up with negative, depressive thoughts. We've also come up with a new construct of, of how antidepressants might work. We, the traditional drugs, like the SSRIs, they work on the 5-HT1A receptor. We found come up with a, another theory of how you can lift depression through changing cortical processing to allow people to think much more constructively about the nature of their depression. So antidepressant drugs, they buffer you, they protect you against the stress of life so that you can slowly uh, overcome the misery of your depression, whereas these drugs Reformate, reformat the way you think about your life so that you can become recover much faster. And um, I just want to finish with two quotes. This is George Bernard Shaw, the great uh, philosopher and playwright, and he said, those who cannot change their mind cannot change anything. And that's really, I think, critical, because it seems to me that the way we change the minds of many people, there are probably some of you, hopefully, in the, in the audience who came rather sceptical, hopefully I've changed your minds, it actually... These drugs have an enormously important role, not just in neuroscience, but also in therapy. And it's the science which has allowed us to have the confidence to move into therapy. It's no longer hand-waving, it's no longer caftans and 
and tie-dyes its neuroscience dragons. And I just want to finish as you, with my favourite author, as you probably guessed, Aldous Huxley. So here he is, another one of his insights. Greatest truth, but still greater from a practical point of view, is silence about truth. By simply not mentioning certain subjects, totalitarian propagandists have influenced opinion much more effectively than they could have by the most eloquent denunciations. Again, that was about politics, but this is also about science and the drug laws, and this is what we have lived with for the last 50 years. And I'm, you know, I'm so glad that, that me and a few others now are, are telling the truth about these drugs. These drugs are not terrifying. They're actually potentially enormously empowering, uh, scientifically fascinating, and they could be therapeutically really revolutionary. And I just feel so sorry for the, you know, the millions of people whose lives might have been improved over the last 50 years if the American um, drug enforcement agencies hadn't lied about them and we hadn't simply followed the American approach to drug and banning drugs. So now it's time for a rational and enlightened approach. And Thank goodness we've got a society in Oxford that can do that. Thank you very much. Okay, that's great. So what happens, I don't know if you heard, so how many of you heard about Denver last week? So what happened, what did the FDA say? The FDA, as soon as it happened, they put out a, they put out a statement saying, these are dangerous drugs, and they're addictive. I mean, a fantasy, complete fantasy. Where are the American scientists saying, no, they're not? These drugs are not addictive for that reason. If you take them every day, within three days, the effect has worn off. How do we know that? Because the American army showed us that when they were developing it as a weapon of war. They thought, how long will, it, how long will we have to treat our people so they won't be affected if the Russians spray them with LSD and we can spray the Russians with LSD? So the US military showed that the effect is very transient. And, uh, so yes, they're, so they're not addictive, they're anti-addictive, and they do cause tolerance. The mechanism is not fully understood, but it's probably some kind of receptor internalization. Or the pharmacology of these drugs is extraordinarily complicated due to the fact that there are two different messenger systems in the brain they work on. But let me just emphasize one thing really important. Just to emphasize again, those effects we got in depression were from a single dose, a single dose to produce lifelong or certain month, month, month long changes in mood. There's no other treatment that can do that. It's, so it, even though they might produce tolerance to the next dose, they have initiated a fundamental alteration in the way your brain works, so that whatever causes depression is now put to one side for a while. Next question, yeah. Um, so you've got some positive evidence already. Is there another particular finding or something in the future that you hope to find that you think have the biggest impact in terms of improving legislation or having impact on governments? So yes, I mean, so let me just tell you what we're doing. We're now, we've got funding from another charity to do a, the, the study we wanted to do was a kind of controlled trial. We're doing psilocybin, this time two doses, three weeks apart, to see if we can prolong the effect, as you saw, slipping off by, by three months. There is escitalopram. Escitalopram is the strongest, best, cleanest SSRI. 
So that study is designed predominantly to test the theory I showed you there that there are two different mechanisms in the brain. But it'll also give us some pointers as to whether uh, the one might be better than the other. And we do have permission to use it in people who are not resistant. So some of the people going into this trial are not, haven't found another treatment. So we might get a better. The true power of this would be in people who have not had any other treatment. That would be when you might maximize the power. But then, of course, I'm not everyone would want them. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Just one more, please. Thanks. Um, I just wondered about a few years ago when you were taking off the Drugs Advisory Committee. Yeah. Did that feel like another step back, like 50 years ago? And how did it make you feel? Yeah, no, well, thank you. It's, um, we were just on the way up. This is David. David, put your hand up. This is David Babcock. He's the chief executive of the charity called Drug Science, which I set up after, the, after being sacked. And, uh, uh, well, I can say many things. One thing's for sure, that they haven't shut me up. If they hope, hope I could crawl back into my shell, they were wrong. And I'm a great believer in um, sort of the, act, the active defense, or the passive defense. Is it? Passive defense is kind of a repressive reaction. I, I, I tend to take a manic reaction, because they weren't expecting. Um, uh, the second thing, the sacking was, tr so it's 10 years. We're going to have a celebration in October. Get ready for this. <laughs> October the 30th is, we're going to have a big celebration. Because that's 10 years have been transformational. Because having sacked me, they sacked me for telling the truth about drugs. And having sacked me, it, it kind of, what else could I do? I mean, they could have incentivized me. They could have offered me millions of pounds or a place in a you know, seat in the House of Lords, you know, to shut me up. I wouldn't have taken it, but they could have tried. But sacking was the stupidest thing to do, because what else have I got? I'm going to just campaign and campaign. And, uh, and the reason this is all happening is because there was a debate going on. Uh, until I was sacked, most scientists wouldn't dare go on the media and say what I've said about drugs. Now, it's, you know, we're having discussions. How useful! is side aside, but not, oh my God, could I possibly take it? Because, you know, I'm like, so we, the whole landscape has completely changed. And I'm proud of that. I mean, it's been hard work, but, uh, but I think we're getting somewhere. We'll find out, we'll find out with the 10 year retrospective how far we've got. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Question comes in two parts. First is, um, of all the individuals that you've studied, be it those who suffer from depression or simple brain scanning or otherwise, do you have you only taken individuals who have had no experience with psychedelics in the past? And part B to that question is, if you have worked with individuals or scanned individuals' brains who have claimed to have engaged with psychedelics on a recreational basis in the past, do you experience a difference in reaction when they subsequently engage with the drug on a therapeutic basis? Understudied. Yeah, so, so those are very good questions. And the answer is, to the first part, a few had taken them before, but not to treat their depression. Did they do differently? Not obviously, but... So I don't think there's any enduring tolerance. And we know that because one of the guys who works with me, David Aritzo, he did a beautiful study when he was uh, working in Denmark, where he looked at people who use a lot of recreational psychedelics and looked at their brains to see if there were changes in their work. So we're, we don't believe that early use or pre-prior use makes you less likely to respond. I mean, obviously there's a sort of selection, potential selection artifact that, that people, people have to volunteer to go into the study and oh, people who used them before potentially got benefit and were likely to volunteer. Um, and that's been seen in one or two of the American studies. That, you know, there is a, sort of, a bit of self-selection. Um, the other converse of that, of course, is perhaps the more important one. The people that are scared of doing it, they, you know, they might benefit, but they would never get it. And that's one of the big problems we have, you know, in terms of, that's why the, his, the, the most people still believe that they couldn't, most people don't want to believe that they've been lied to for 50 years. Because what else have you been lied to about? Well, actually, it's a lot of things, but let's not get it. <laughs> and it's kind of, so they would prefer to, and therefore, and so we've got patients who say, well, I, I won't take it, and, also, and they also, I've got patients who say, I won't take it, because it's, so how can I help someone now if they want, can't go to the trial? Well, I can say, you could have, you know, if you wanted to, you could 
tends to do what lots of other people do and find marshals and take them because I think that's breaking the law. There are people who say, I won't break the law because I might lose my job, because I can't. Emotionally, I can't break the law. Other possibilities, I go to places like the Netherlands where they are, to some extent, awful. And people say, well, you know, I don't want to go and be treated by a doctor in a foreign country. So, so there are, you know, there are, there are, there are barriers to people using them, even if they might benefit. And there are almost certainly people who would benefit or never use them because they're too frightening or they're, you know, for other reasons. Hi, Ed. So um, one thing that comes across when we read about people who've had experiences where they've been ill or, or normal or, or, sorry, or not, not ill is that people report the, the a lot of, they, they, report the, they, they report that a lot of different areas of their life have improved. They've become, yeah. they've resolved uh, grief, they've resolved anger, previous relationships, you know, um, guilt, yeah. a lot, all these, it, it seems to help in all these yeah. different areas. Yeah. I'm a psychiatrist and we, we don't, those aren't diagnostics, they're not, they're not categories correct, that we treat. Correct, correct. So, but, but it would be a shame to lose. I mean, it, it's there's amazing would. potential in it. it. So, how, how do you see that happening? How, how are we going to be able to prescribe for people to yeah, resolve well, anger? We fought through this. It's very interesting. So, what's happening now is it based on our study and based on two American studies which looked at people who had end of life terminal diagnoses, end of life anxiety where there was positive effects of psilocybin. The, the company that has got medical psilocybin made and tested went with me, I went with them to the European Medicines Agency to argue that it would be good if they would, would they approve a, a study to help people who were dying? And they said no. And why not? Because dying is not a diagnosis. So, it's a fact, but not a diagnosis. So then we retreated, and then we thought again what we should do, and then we decided it would be, the only thing they would accept was a, was a treatment of depression, resistant depression. So then, that is what is happening. There's a multi-center trial of treatment-resistant depression happening across Europe. It's been given what's called fast-track status by the European Medicines Agency. So if it works, it's a dose, the three doses, so there's, hopefully there'll be a dose response. If it works, the highest dose works, the 25 milligram dose works, it's going to be a medicine. Once it's a medicine, then doctors like you have much more opportunity to use it. So that's the tap we're taking. Now, there are, other, there are people who disagree with us. There are certainly there are people in, there are psychedelic enthusiasts in some countries who think it's absolutely wrong that we are trying to make a medicine out of it because this is a universal good. But the reality is, I, I personally, I think it, 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 we're going to do more, give more service to humanity by making a medicine than by simply saying, well, go and pick some mushrooms and take them. Uh, yeah? Hi. Um, I realize you just said the research on this is still ongoing, so this might be a question, be a question mark. But if psychedelics do take off as a, an accepted medical treatment, conditions like that. Do you think there still will be a role to play for traditional anti antidepressants like SSRIs? Will they sort of supersede them? No, it's a really interesting question. And um, I think it's, what I, what I foresee happening, I think the, the problem with psychedelics, as you saw, is that in the end, most people relapse. Now that's because whatever depression is, it's not simple. It's in, you know, it's it's like a a worm in your brain which is driving you to think negative thoughts. And it's a, one of the great, to my mind, one of the really interesting questions we're trying to resolve in this controlled trial against escitalopram will help us is where does it reside, and what is the switch that allows it to come back into consciousness so it slowly takes over your thinking. So anyway, put that to one side. So. How could you keep it under control? Well, there are two ways to keep it under control. One would be to every three months or so have a, a psychedelic trip, you know, and that would make maybe you know go to a spa, you know, yoga, warmth, go, you know, I mean, do the right things to get you into a right state. Have a have a psychedelic experience and get over it. But another approach might well be particularly, and it, it might be less expensive to 
get over your depression and try to keep your depression at bay through an SSRI. Um, time will tell which of those is going to be more effective uh, and more importantly cost effective. Because one thing's important, although these treatments only be only giving one dose, as I say, the effect, and you could say, okay, one dose, three months benefit, well that's great. But actually that one dose isn't one dose. That one dose is two therapists, there's days of preparation, there's the whole exposure, the whole day of the trip, there's the debriefing for and the integration sessions for weeks afterwards. So it actually turns, actually we got more questions when we went to the European Values Agency from NICE. They were more hostile than the regulators. The regulators saw this, if we could get the target right, as being a revolution because there are no new innovations in depression apart from ketamine. <laughs> it was nice that it said, well, it's going to be expensive. Uh, well, yeah, that's right. Well, how, you yeah. know, even, even if this trial works, it may not be allowed in Britain because I start to say, well, you know, all that therapy time, you know, just give them an acid, that's all right, they're cheap as chips. But other countries, I'm sure, will make it available. <laughs> um, so, Obviously, once the trip is over, generally the drug is pretty clean out of the system. Yes. But for people who use quite frequently, recreationally, yeah. is there a difference between, say, their brain and someone else's? Um, and obviously, there are, you can get lasting effects like HBPD or something. Yes, that's right. And some people so, yeah. can obviously have mental issues triggered or yep. something like that. No, there's lots of different, yeah, some important points there. So. There's a guy that trolls me all the time saying, why aren't I curing HPPD? HPPD is hallucinogen pers persisting perceptual disorder. So these are people who get flashing lights or strange colours or <coughs> alterations in their vision often. It's usually a visual risk. So there's kind of visual distortions which can last either, can be permanent or enduring or episodic, but they come after a trip and they last for some while. I mean, they exist, they occur obviously, my own view is that, I mean, they're relatively rare, and they're not, a, they become a problem when people think they've got brain damage. So they, you know, when people come to me with this, and they, you know, they, why are you worried? Well, am I, have I, is my brain dead? No, it's not, you know, maybe actually, you can still go back to university, you know, just try to distract yourself a bit. So a lot of it becomes some, slightly self hypochondriacal We don't know why it happens, but it does happen, and it's a, it's a, when it, ha it can be unfortunate, but it's not, it's, it's rarely impairing. Um, people who use these drugs a lot, with David Aritzo has studied their brains. Their brains are normal. So you don't get, it's not like you're poisoning your brain with something really toxic like alcohol. Uh, and it might be that, you know, well, yeah, at least the way measures we have, they seem to be perfectly cognitively in, intact. Their receptors are normal, their brain anatomy is normal. Uh, so, but there are, then, then you get to the third point, the question you raised, which is written a bad trip, what happens if you have a bad trip? Well, I think it's really important to say that very few of our patients had a good trip. Uh, there's a film you can see, it's called Magic Medicine. It, sh it takes three of our patients through their experiences. And there's two of them had horrible trips. Because, well, what would you expect? You know, these are seriously depressed people who've been traumatized using childhood. And they're really having the trauma and trying to make sense of it. It's not very fun. They're horrible trips, but they overcome them. They, they actually came out. And a lot of people say, that, yeah, I had a bad trip, but actually I feel better. Because it does help you think differently. So I think that trying to <coughs> escape from bad trips, particularly if you're trying to improve your sense of you know, well-being, isn't necessarily bad. But the, thing, the key thing is, if you're going to have a bad trip, you've got to have a bad trip in a secure environment. Like, like a therapy room with some therapists. You don't want to have a bad trip, you know, if you're standing on Peachy Head or somewhere, you might be <laughs> Hi, um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for really your work. Um, I think very few people have both the knowledge and the willpower to challenge a lot of, um, I suppose, boundaries that our society imposes. Um, so my question is around um, your future research. Um, are you planning at all at any point to look into the effects of psychedelics um, for people with autism? Yeah, well, I, 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 at least one email a day talks about that. Mm -hmm. 
And it's a, so I got, I got a wonderful email yesterday from someone who thought, a 40 year old who said, I've kind of really cured my Asperger's by, by taking mushrooms. And then I get a parent today saying, should I be giving psilocybin to my child with all? The answer is, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I, 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 I did, there is, it's a really interesting question. Is it possible to help people with autism? I mean, you know, autism isn't a single syndrome. And, it's, it's not implausible. It is not implausible, but whether, and, and certainly if, uh, I would not dissuade an adult with autism for thinking it through and possibly seeking that kind of approach in a careful setting. Using it in children at present, I think, is too premature. Thank you. Hi. Um, you mentioned in your talk that the psychedelic state um, kind of mirrors the type of processing that babies and children experience. Yes. And that becoming an adult and being socialized is sort of a um, way of closing the doors to perception, sure. in a sense. Yeah. And so while it would be very hard to research the effects of psychedelics at different stages of development, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how it affects development, even in like yeah. 18 to 25 year olds, if it can have lasting effects while the brain is in a more plastic period of its Almost certainly. Well, I think the good news is 18 year olds are adults, so we can give it to them. <laughs> <laughs> so we have done a study, and we haven't got them. Well, we've, so we just finished. Uh, I suppose probably the first study that's been done where we have taken psychedelic naive adults and given them psilocybin, single dose, and monitored outcomes, both in terms of well-being, cognition, mood, and also brain imaging uh, over a period of a month and a half. And yes, they tend to have improved improvements in well-being. And uh, hopefully, in a few months, I'll be able to tell you where in the brain the changes have occurred which do that. So, so the answer is, I'm, yeah, I think it's, it's very likely that young people, that the brains are more susceptible and potentially it's going to be more valuable to young people. Um, but uh, going below, below the age of consent is going to be quite tricky. Thank you. Uh, Theo, you made it. <laughs> he used to work with me. <laughs> I see you again. Um, thanks very much for this, uh, baby. Um, a quick question, if you can comment a little bit on PTSD, whether we know anything about that, whether it could have a potential role in that. And also, what we know about any types of psychotherapy that, I mean, I know psychoanalysts used to use it in the 50s, but mm. how much do we know now about what types of approach people are? I mean, you mentioned some studies in America, which is mm. a few updates, if you can. Well, it's a great, so, there are two, so let's talk about the psych, so, Everything we do, we do having two therapists or two people, all with one trained therapist in the room for the whole duration of the trip. We don't make people talk. We're not trying to. Trying to it's not like when we use MDMA to treat PTSD, where you, you want people to relive the trauma to overcome the trauma. With psychedelic psychotherapy, actually, you can't make people do anything because if you try, they just. They get angry because if if you are talking to God, it's a bit trivial to talk to me. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean good as I am. But, um, so we don't. We let people go where they want to go, and actually, most of them don't want to talk because it's, what's going on in here is way more interesting. But even if it's painful, but the real the real psychotherapy comes afterwards. It's, it's making sense of their insights and their observations and their you know the, trying to pull together you know what how best to maximize the therapeutic benefit. So this is, psycho, this is we either call this psychedelic assisted psychotherapy or psychotherapy assisted psychedelic or psychopharmacology. And we haven't agreed which way it is at present. But what's the best kind of psychotherapy? That's a really, really interesting question. We think it's probably not CBT because these people are all, they will fail on it. In fact, if you read the paper that we wrote about, the narratives paper, so me as a, kind of card-carrying psychopharmacologist, probably the, one of the best papers I've ever written, is in the Journal of Humanistic Psychology, 
I didn't even know he existed until I started doing this research. But one of my therapists who wanted to publish it, and it's an amazing paper because it, people talk about the experience of the trip and getting over the depression. And they talk about defragging and they hard drive and they talk about you know, um, wiping the dry clean. But they also talk much powerfully about being connected with the world again. Depression's a horrible disorder because you, you're so inter you're so thinking about yourself, you lose connection with the world. You know, if you live with someone who's depressed, it's very hard to relate to them because they're always in there worrying. So they talk about that as well. And, and that comes from a very, um, I suppose, interpretative, it's not analytical, but it's, it's much more, it's, it's in a type of, more in a psychodynamic form. Look for the cause, look for the solution, and try to resolve it that way. But there might be better ways, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 it's going to be difficult to formally study. But, and it may be different for different people. Because even though some of, the, some of our patients, they saw what caused their depression. They went there, they dealt with it, they destroyed it. You know, the devil was gone. But it still comes back. And it may be when it's coming back, CBT would be better at holding it down. You know, I mean, so there are different approaches we could potentially take. But one, at least we've got, we can get them into a position where they're better able to do psychotherapy. Did you describe your best trip? Or best trip something you described to you? So, well, the one, one we had just recently, which was um, extraordinary, we will publish this, as an ex if the man allows us to. It was extraordinarily moving. Um, and he talks about going, going, I kind of touched on this there, he, go, he talks about going into deep and deep and deeper into his brain, the darker, darker recesses. And then he goes deep, deep, you know, like he's way beyond himself, he's somewhere in the universe. And he finds this solid sphere of metal, like a kind of hard uh, metallic egg. And then he breaks it, and he's liberated. He sees that as a kind of giant weight crushing him, in, in, you know, emotionally. Uh, that's his depression, he breaks it and he's out. And it's extraordinary. Now, I mean, let's hope he stays undepressed forever. I don't know, I mean, if he does, it'd be fantastic. But it's an extraordinarily powerful narrative. And we get quite a number like that. And I, I really want to publish them if they give us permission. Um, yeah, thank you again for everything that you stand for. Um, I was just wondering if you think that the future is looking brighter for a widespread acceptance of these ideas. Uh, well, I think amongst intelligent people, there is a good future. But in Britain, if you ask the question, you know, what about, you know, we made, cannabis was made legal, medical cannabis made legal on the 1st of November. How many prescriptions in the last six months? Ten. Because the medical profession is terrified, is terrified of treating people with cannabis. And the same is going to be true. With this. And why is that? So I've read a I was an article in the BMJ two weeks ago. It, it, there are several reasons. One is that a lot of doctors are cowards. They don't want to engage with something new. Secondly, they've been lying to us. You know, they, they're the ones that are telling the lies about the harms. And it's very difficult for them to say, oh, sorry, God, it, you know, actually, it's just pretending. Here, so, even though they know. You know I mean, uh, so and the third is that actually the, it's, a lot of doctors don't want to do what their patients want because it puts the patients in control. It's, it's kind of infantile, but sadly, you know, a lot of doctors think, I'm the boss. We got to this absurdity where this, there's a woman who's a professor of paediatric neurology in Great Ormond Street, who said two months ago, she would not prescribe cannabidiol, which is an utterly safe drug, to a patient, a child with epilepsy, until they had exhausted all proven treatments, including brain surgery. <laughs> but this is, this is, this is, you know, but this is, and, but they can defend it, they say, you can say, but there's no evidence for kind of other than the fact that all these kids have stopped dying, or stop, but there's no real evidence, because there's not evidence that we have generated as doctors in the way we're taught now, you've got to have controlled trials. Some of these syndromes are so rare, you couldn't do a controlled trial for 50 years. So, you know, medicine has kind of lost its soul, and until we get the doctors back on side, we're going to be very difficult. And of course, we've got to get the politicians. I mean, we, but maybe, maybe cannabis is a start. At least we've, for the first time, got the politicians kind of wanting to push it out of politics. Psychedelics are going to be much harder. But the good news is that the, the, the greatest opponent to psychedelic 
studies in Britain is a woman called Theresa May. And I guess she won't be around in politics much longer. So, so there's hope. We have two questions if you tell me. Um, the first, have there been many studies done with uh, microdosing? And if not, could you give us your prediction on the efficacy? And secondly, the setting, how does the setting of the psychedelic trip uh, influence the sure. project itself? So let's start with the second one, setting, as I sort of intimated. We believe that if you're going to go through a powerful experience like this, particularly your depressed person, it's got to be in a very safe, contained, uh, protected environment. So we try to make the room, and we, we have to work in a room where our room, we do psychedelic therapy. The next room, they do gene therapy. So theirs is utterly sterile, and our, we try to make ours somewhat more pleasant and homely and, and, and appealing and relaxed, and like the one you saw in John Hopkins. It's, it's quite difficult, actually, because there are... The regulations about what you can do in hospital, you know, there's a lot of stuff we can't put in there because they don't comply with all these sort of safety stuff. But we get over that. We eventually get something which is a nicer place than a, a, a you know, bare steel um, bed. So we, and we've got the therapist and we have music and we think music's important. But music is difficult because some people don't like the music. Some people, I mean, the, you know, trying to maximize the benefit, the, the, the individualize the music so that people can maybe get the natural. So I think that's, that's really important, having at least one trained therapist and usually one learner therapist in the room as well. Microdosing. Microdosing is taking a dose which should be an non-detectable dose or low detectable dose. I mean, millions of people are doing it. Does it do anything? No one knows because no one's ever done a study because you can't do a study because it's illegal. So we, we for two years, I've, had, I've, got, an, I've got permission from the Imperial College to do a, a study of microdosing. But because that involves bringing, giving people LSD twice a week for six weeks, and each dose, even if it's a microdose, has to be given in hospital, stay in hospital for eight hours, it's too expensive. Because, you know, because, you know that, you're talking about 24 separate days in hospital. I mean, it's just crazily expensive. So that's why no one's ever done a micro proper microdosing study. So, will it work? I think it might. I think it might have some. I don't think it's going to treat depression, but it might be quite useful for people who kind of want to help deal with problems. And people are using it and to try to become more creative and solve problems. And you know, it's a big thing in Silicon Valley. Someone told me that eighty percent of Google employees are microdosing. But, uh, <laughs> Whether, whether it, it won't be as a big a re, it won't be a revolution as the macrodose for, for people with mental illness. It might be useful. For them. Was there a question up there? So obviously the science is moving along, if a little too slowly, um, but it is moving along. I was wondering, can you talk at all about the, um, I suppose the media strategy? Because I come and see you once a year. I read the old article here and there. Yeah, Anna Hari's book on. Um, drug war, uh, Joe Rogan, biggest, biggest fan of DMT on, on the planet. Um, I just wondering if there was a, a media strategy, a society strategy, so that actually the regulators have to bow. Because if you look at the marijuana thing, that was the media that got that changed, and it got changed very quickly. Okay, they're not prescribing it, but... No, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, so I'm doing my very best not to alienate the game, though. But they, it's quite difficult not to do. <laughs> They're very easy, in it? Because of course they choose. So even I mean, that was two years ago. We did a very nice article with the one of the few male journalists that I trust about the first depression study, and his article was perfectly reasonable. But the headline was, "Would you give your mother mushrooms to psychedelic drugs?" <laughs> so, yeah, what is the strategy? The strategy is to keep talking to intelligent people like you, who will talk to your mothers. Tell them to stop reading the mail, or the Express, or the Telegraph, and gradually it will get, eliminate that, those sources of, of misinformation. But beyond that, I mean, it, I think the media strategy will come when, if the drug gets a license. If the drug gets a license, it, it will be very difficult to not allow doctors to prescribe it. So that's why I'm putting so much effort into trying to get the trials done. Uh, hi, I was wondering if you could give your thoughts. Could um, you wave so I can see you? Sorry, yes, uh, in the middle. Hi. 
I was wondering if you could give a bit more thoughts on DMT and especially its therapeutic potential, given that it works at such short time spans, you know, 10 minutes, and very reliably induces a normally positive effect of being transported to, you know, like hyperreal dreams. It's a really interesting question, and I, I think it's, it's, one of, it's a great scientific question. Can you kind of zap someone out of their depression, or do they need the five hours of working through their, their tra traumas? It's a really great question. And I hope we, at some point, you know, when we're more confident about what we're doing with DMT, we might hopefully get a graph to do that. It would be a really interesting head to head. My guess is it won't be as good as psilocybin. I actually think that there's something about, or LSD, there's something about engaging with your problem for longer. I don't, I think DMT might be like ketamine. You can zap yourself and you're not depressed for a few days. But ketamine, ketamine basically switches off your awareness of your depression for a few days, and it comes back. You keep taking the ketamine and keep going. I suspect DMT might be a little bit more like that, but it, or it might be half somewhere between ketamine and, and psilocybin. But my guess would be that psilocybin would probably give people more uh, insights and powers to to deal with the origins of the depression. It's not just switching it off for a short while. Thanks. Um, can we have uh, one or two more questions? Yeah, sure. I've got 10 minutes. I've okay. got 10 minutes, haven't I? Right. Um, hi. What's your prediction um, for when um, we'll be able to prescribe our patients? Um, sorry, sorry, yeah. Well, my asking. hope is before I die. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, my ambition is to stay alive till it's. That's my ambition. I'm 68. <laughs> yeah, I'm six. So, yes. So we have yeah. a good... Maybe microdosing would be better than that. I think five years. I'm hoping to live long enough to see it as well. So five years. Yes. That's encouraging. I think it will be. I think it will be in five years in some countries. It is in other... I mean, ayahuasca is a medicine in Mexico and Brazil. You know, it's now... You know, it's not licensed, not sold, but it is legal. Okay. One last question, then go on then. Uh, so I assume that the uh, secondary access to consciousness, the uh, psychedelic access you talk about, is implicated in uh, perhaps sleep and meditation to some aspects too. It's not exclusively psychedelic. That's um, a really interesting question. But secondly, my essay, uh, why do you assign meaning to it? To what? To that uh, access you put meaning in there as opposed to analytical. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. So let's 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 go out. Let's do the first question first. So, it is a different form of consciousness to dreaming. I mean, clearly it overlaps. I mean, people have interesting uh, visual sometimes and often you know, sort of narrative constructs during dreaming. But I've yet, and I used to run a sleep clinic. Yeah. And a lot of people have very horrible dreams um, when they particularly got PTSD. But I've never yet met anyone that's come out of a dream saying, I met God. So there's a spiritual element to psychedelics which is fundamentally different from dreaming. And why that is, is kind of that's why we're doing the DMT study. You know, I want to find out where those, you know, those, the, the meetings with the greater being are in the brain, if they're there at all. So, uh, so dreaming is orthogonal to, uh, to the psychedelic state. And also it's different from psychedelic state if you don't remember your dreams as you wake up. So, Dreaming is not a conscious state, whereas this is a conscious state. And um, you said sleep as well, did you? Or uh, and meditation. Meditation. Now, meditation is fascinating. Uh, because I, I had no idea uh, that there was a brain imaging to meditation until a week after we published our first imaging paper on psilocybin. And then uh, Judd Brewer from Yale said, hey, look, we published this paper on fMRI and meditation three weeks ago. Why didn't you say, well, we couldn't cite it because it didn't. And it's got the same. If you can, it trans people who get good meditators who can transcend get the same switch offs at the default mode as we get in the psychedelics. The only difference is it takes them 20 years and we get, we get about 20 seconds. So it's a bit of a shortcut. But, but, but that's not, that's kind of, that's a bit trivial to say that. But, what the people at John Hopkins have pulled the two together. So John Hopkins have used psychedelics to accelerate the ability of people to get into that deep transcendental state, which is like extreme mindfulness. So 
Mindfulness is a powerful way of, way of dealing with many mental problems. And if we could accelerate these, these psychedelics to help people get mindful control, like in meditation.